In this installment, we turn from the subjects of legislative control and executive control to the subject of judicial control of agency action. This is the major topic in administrative law. Judicial review of agency action is going to be our meat and potatoes for the rest of the semester, so to speak. Our starting point is the seminal case of Citizens to Preserve Overton Park versus John Volpe, Secretary of Transportation. A little background may be helpful. In the year 1919, a young army officer named Dwight Eisenhower was tasked to road test America's highways by, going, by driving from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. The convoy took 62 days to reach its destination. Later, as Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, Eisenhower was impressed by the German highway network in the territories he took. As President Eisenhower, he said, Germany had made me see the wisdom of broader ribbons across the land. As President Eisenhower, he pushed for the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, the beginning of the interstate highway system. Under this and later statutes, the federal government paid 90% of the cost of construction. The Secretary of Transportation had final say as to whether to release funds, but the states took the leading role in routing the highways within their respective state lines. The German autobahns had been built to give urban dwellers access to the countryside. The planners in the State Departments of Transportation reversed the process. They routed interstates through the middle of downtowns. President Eisenhower was not happy about this. Bulldozing urban neighborhoods was not what he had had in mind. He had proposed roads between cities, not through them. Members of Congress were unhappy, too. They passed legislation that was meant to at least protect city parks that were tempting to planners to use as an alternative to plowing through neighborhoods. The thought of perimeter roads staying outside city limits altogether seems not to have occurred to the highwaymen until later. The statute at issue in Overton Park reads, The Secretary shall not approve any project that requires the use of any public parkland unless there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the use of such land, and such program includes all possible planning to minimize harm to such park. Overton Park in Memphis was designed by landscape architect George Kessler, a pupil of Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Piedmont Park in Atlanta. It is hard to imagine why the Secretary of Transportation might approve an interstate highway running through this park, but if we zoom out, we see that the park is surrounded by neighborhoods, and the park is situated almost immediately between suburbs and the interior of Tennessee to the east, and downtown Memphis and the I-40 interstate bridge across the Mississippi River to Arkansas to the west. The direct path connecting the two existing stretches of I-40 went through the park. Going around the park to the immediate north or south would displace thousands of residents, businesses, and institutions. The cost of condemning the right-of-way and compensating the property owners above and below the park was reckoned to be far greater than the cost of taking a slice of the park, which was already public property. Tunneling under the park would be hugely expensive, too, so also a bridge over it, which anyway would be unsightly. The city of Memphis, the state of Tennessee, and ultimately the Secretary of Transportation saw no feasible and prudent alternative. The Secretary of Transportation approved a final design rooted through the park. The Citizens to Preserve Overton Park brought suit in district, federal district court praying for an injunction of construction. You might wonder, what did, right did these citizens have to be heard on the matter in court? The city had held hearings, as had the Department of Transportation. The citizens had had a chance to have a say. They lost. Why should a court listen to them? Later in the semester, we will cover the topic of standing. But aside from that, you may wonder, why should a court get involved in a dispute over where to route a highway? 
Judges aren't engineers or architects or accountants, nor are they elected, nor do they represent any affected person or interest. Moreover, the question of the best way of routing a highway through a city doesn't li sound like something that could be decided by applying any legal rule. It's rather one of those multidimensional, multifactorial, polycentric decisions that can always have been made differently. What can a judge do to improve this kind of process? For answers, we look to the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946. The court applies this statute to determine whether or not judicial review is available at all. The court concludes that it is. The APA creates a broad presumption in favor of judicial review of agency action. We will turn to the subject of the availability of judicial review and its exceptions in a few weeks. But as Justice Marshall writes for the court, the existence of judicial review is only the start. Okay, there's judicial review, now what? The standard for review must also be determined. For that, we must look to section 706 of the Administrative Procedure Act. The focus of judicial review is agency action. Reviewing viewing court shall hold unlawful agency action found to be arbitrary, capricious, an abuse of discretion, or otherwise contrary to law, b. contrary to constitutional right, c. in excess of statutory jurisdiction, authority, or limitations, d. without observance of procedure required by law, e. unsupported by substantial evidence in a case subject to sections 556 and 557, or f. unwarranted by the facts. To the, to the extent that the facts are subject to trial de novo. The focus, again, is on agency action. The first and most fundamental question in analyzing an administrative law issue is, what action or actions did the agency take or fail to take that a party might ask a court to set aside and hold unlawful? That can sometimes be a sure a chore. Sometimes what the agency did is, is unclear, but not in the Overton Park case. Plainly, there is no ambiguity, the court wrote, the Secretary has approved the construction of I-40 through Overton Park and has approved a specific design. The Overton Park opinion walks us through the standards of review that a court might apply. A. Arbitrary capricious. The first standard is typically condensed to the phrase arbitrary or capricious. The two concepts, arbitrariness and capriciousness, are not treated as distinct. <clears throat> For that reason, lawyers sometimes say arbitrary and capricious, because if an action is one, it is also the other two. We will come back to this issue in a moment. Be unconstitutional. The Citizens to Preserve Overton Park did not argue that any statute was unconstitutional. Anyway, the statutes would easily satisfy the intelligible principle test as it had come to be interpreted. So we can tick off this box. Notice that Section 706 tells the court to hold unlawful an agency action that fails any of these. Contrary to statute. Was the action contrary to statute? Let's come back to this and to the question of the agency action fail to follow required procedure. The citizens argued that the Secretary's approval of the plan violated standards E and F. E, unsupported by substantial evidence. F, lacking factual warrant. Not sure about arbitrary and capricious, not unconstitutional, come back to contrary to statute, come back to procedurally defective. We're looking at these, which right now, which the citizens to preserve Overton Park urged. Why do the citizens argue for E and F? The reason for arguing for E is that the substantial evidence standard applies only when the agency had to follow so-called formal procedures that resemble a civil trial. 
The court does not agree that the agency was required to base its action on the evidence developed on the record of a formal hearing, and so it declines to apply the substantial evidence standard. Standard F, lacking factual warrant, only applies in the rare circumstance that the court itself is required to try the facts. Judicial review of agency action typically requires reviewing a factual record already in existence created by the agency. It does not involve a trial de novo, Latin for anew, in federal court. So B is no ground for holding the highway funding unlawful, and E and F do not apply. Let's go back to the top of the list. Was it arbitrary or capricious to act as the agency did? It seems as though quite a lot of planning and thought went into the decision. The city, the state, and the Department of Transportation concurred in it. And two lower federal courts had already upheld the agency action. How could it be arbitrary or capricious? The secretary had gotten summary judgment in federal court on the basis of his affidavit, in which he recited all the studies and deliberations and factors that could support his decision that there was no prudent feasible alternative to routing I-40 through the park, and that all possible planning had gone into minimizing the impact on the park. Of course, the citizens disagreed. But surely one can disagree without being arbitrary or capricious about it. But the Supreme Court announces that the Secretary's affidavit is irrelevant. <clears throat> Judicial review under the arbitrary or capricious standard is not about, after the fact, post hoc rationalizations. Affidavits prepared after the fact for the purpose of litigation do not tell the court whether the agency acted arbitrarily or capriciously. The issue is not whether there are good reasons for acting as the agency did, but whether the agency, when it acted, did act on good reasons. The lawyers for the Secretary of Transportation may have done a great job in assembling and articulating reasons for which the Secretary might have acted, but what the court has to know is why the Secretary did act. Post hoc rationalizations don't address that. Well, if the affidavit is out, what does the court want to see? Doesn't the court have to set aside that action and remand to the agency to do it all over again? No. There is an administrative record that allows the full prompt review of the agent's secretary's action without additional de delay, which will result from having to a remand to the secretary. So a judicial review is a matter of the administrative record as it existed at the moment the agency acted. It already exists. Does the court take a look? The record is not, however, before us. The court can't. The administrative record is not before the court. The procedural posture of the case is such that a court cannot conduct arbitrary capricious standard review. Nor, for that matter, can the court tell whether the agency acted on the ba basis of a mistaken understanding of the statute. The agency's lawyers argued for an interpretation of the statute that gives the secretary wide latitude to balance economic, recreational, and aesthetic values. The court rejects that interpretation. Congress wanted to save parkland at all costs unless there were truly unusual countervailing factors. But since the administrative record is not before the court, it cannot tell whether the secretary acted on a misunderstanding of his statutory duty. The court can't tell why he acted at all. Just as it's not proper to take the affidavit the lawyers prepared as relevant to the question what were the reasons the secretary acted upon when he acted, so it's not also not proper to take the lawyer's argument for a broad interpretation of the secretary's discretion as relevant to the question what understanding did the secretary act upon when he decided to fund the project. Our casebook editors misspeak when they say that, quote, the court found that the Secretary of Transportation had misinterpreted the statute, close quote. What the editors mean to say is that the procedural posture of the case was such that the court could not make a searching and careful review under the 706A arbitrary or capricious and 706C contrary to statute standards. Gotta have that record. 
Thus, it is necessary to remand this case to the district court for plenary review based on the full administrative record that was before the secretary at the time he made his decisions. The lawyers can argue about what the record shows and about what it has to show, but the legality of the agency action under review is to be decided on the basis of the whole record, is the expression used in Section 706. Really? Every document, memo, note, sketch, drawing, every piece of paper even remotely relevant to highway design that is in the files of the Department of Transportation? Does the APA require the Secretary to make this kind of document dump? No. The whole record or those parts of it cited by a party. A lawyer will endear herself to a court to the extent that she is helpful to the court in cutting through the wall of banker's boxes and directing the court to precisely the language that illuminates the issue. As Justice Marshall counsels, the reviewing court must consider whether the secretary properly construed his authority to approve the use of parkland. Scrutiny of the facts, however, does not end with the determination that the secretary has acted within the scope of his statutory authority. This inquiry into the facts has to be searching and careful. The court must consider whether the decision was made on a consideration of the relevant factors and whether there has been a clear error of judgment. But the ultimate standard is a narrow one. The court is not empowered to substitute its judgment for that of the agency. Bear in mind that Overton Park is a case of first impression of the APA. With the benefit of that decision, agencies later knew what they had to do to get ready to withstand judicial review. But prior to Overton Park, agencies like the Department of Transportation were unlikely to be ready. Since the bare record may not disclose the factors that were considered or the Secretary's construction of the evidence, it may be necessary for the District Court to require some explanation. The citizens argued that the secretary had to make formal findings, but the court did not find any APA basis for insisting on this. But without formal findings or something like them, and without post hoc affidavits, how was a reviewing court to know what was going through the secretary's mind at the time he acted? Inquiry into the mental processes of administrative decision makers is usually to be avoided. The court is realistic about what the effect of allowing aggrieved parties to take depositions of agency officials would be. The Department of Transportation would grind to a standstill, and so also any other federal agency whose actions are subject to judicial review. And the APA presumption is that agency actions are reviewable. The court makes a general suggestion. It may be that the secretary can prepare formal findings. The Secretary of Transportation could make his life a little easier if he would <clears throat> make those findings. Sounds a bit like letting those post hoc rationalizations come in by the back door. But looking ahead, agencies expect to have to jump through the hoops of judicial review. The agencies will know to create an administrative record that is survivable, in which leaves no or little opening for intrusive discovery into the minds of the officials who head the agency. To recap, consider the unusual posture of Overton Park. The court does not want to uphold agency action on the basis of post hoc rationalizations. The case filed by the citizens was initially decided at a summary judgment hearing on the basis of the secretary's affidavit and counsel's argument. What the Supreme Court tells us is that what the court needs is to see the whole record and a contemporaneous explanation. That's judicial review. What was missing was the whole record and the contemporary, con excuse me, contemporaneous explanation. The contemporaneous explanation need not consist in formal findings, as the court explained in a subsequent case, Camp versus Pitts. In this case, the Comptroller of the Currency denied an application for a bank charter, stating simply that the project was uneconomical given the needs of the community. 
there was no re need to remand for any further explanation. Unlike Overton Park, in the present case, there was contemporary explanation of the agency decision. The explanation may have been curt, but it surely indicated the determinative reason for the final agency, for the final action taken. The finding that a new bank was uneconomic, an uneconomic venture in light of services already available in the surrounding community. The validity of the controller's action must therefore stand or fall on the propriety of that finding, judged of course by the appropriate standard of review. If that finding is not sustainable on the administrative record made, then the controller's decision must be vacated and the matter remanded to him for further consideration. So this is the es essence of judicial review of agency action. Contemporary reasoning, a contemporaneous record. Does the agency reasoning at the time it acted comport with law, and does the court see a basis for that reasoning in the record? And by the way, did the citizens succeed in preserving Overton Park? They did. And Overton Park may be the only administrative law decision to have its own historical marker. <laughs>